live from Denver, a DIY community special. Presented by Philly Cam, SPNN, Common Frequency, and G Town. With technical support from the Denver Open Media, KGNU Community Radio, and Live View. NCMR is presented by Free Press. Follow the feed. Let us know what you think. At hashtag NCMR2013. Hi, I'm Vanessa Maria Graber, and we're broadcasting live from the National Conference on Media Reform here in Denver, Colorado. And we're live from the Do It Yourself Community Media Lab. And for the next hour, we'll be talking to people from the conference. So we hope you stay with us and listen to all the great stories we have here in Denver. Welcome back to the Do-It-Yourself Community Media Special. Again, we're here live in Denver from the National Conference on Media Reform, and I have here with me Mike Wassener, who's the Senior Development Officer from Free Press. He's gonna tell us a little bit about what's been going down here in Denver the last day and a half, and what we can look forward to out of this giant conversion of over 3,000 journalists, bloggers, policy makers, and media reformers. Thanks for being on the show, It's Mike. great to be here, Vanessa Maria, and happy to be a part of the, the DIY experience. So, uh, Denver's great. We have all these people coming together here, and it's a, it's a great convergence of policy makers, grassroots activists from around the country, people who make their own media, people who care about the content that's in our media, people who care about making sure that the media is being fair to their communities that they're a part of. They want to see better local stories. They want to see better quality journalism. They want to see less commercialism within the media. And they also want to see a media that actually that, that looks like the people in their neighborhoods, in their communities. They want a media that actually tells their story, and a lot of cases by people who are making their own media, like we have here at the DIY uh, Media Experience. So, I mean, it's a great convergence. The, the, the conference is typically like that. Denver is unique, though, because this is the first time we've really been west of the Mississippi uh, and spent a lot of time with people uh, in the, the Rocky Mountain area, and then also with a lot of activists that are all up and down in the Pacific. So uh, we're getting a great vibe here out in the, the western neck of the woods as opposed to being out east or closer to Washington, D.C. That's, that, that's probably the point of this entire conference is that we think it's important that like policy that shapes uh, how media works in America and actually around the world is not made by people who behind closed doors who make decisions and cut deals that you and I or people out in, in the streets don't know about. That affects people's lives, affects the, qu affects the quality of information that you have that you know shapes your understanding understanding of the world and your ability to connect with other people. We think that people like you and me and people who are watching, people in communities like Denver and actually rural communities throughout Colorado, throughout the Mountain West, actually throughout the United States, should have a say in something that affects so much of their lives. And that's, that's the beauty of this conference, frankly, is that you get all these different people who are doing so many different, curious, wonderful things, and they're you know, getting energy off of one another. I mean, it's a, it's a great experience. Yeah, totally. I leave these conferences. This is my third NCMR. Yep. Um, totally energized. There's all kinds of really great stuff going down here. We're in the Media Lab, which is right next to the Exhibition Hall, where you have all kinds of people doing really cool things. There's a Media Hack Lab, um, you know, people working on open source software. There's people broadcasting from mm -hmm. Free Speech TV, mm -hmm. Democracy Now!, there's people doing poetry. I really like the soapbox, you know, yep. and that's something that's new to the conference. Um, you know, people having the opportunity to just, you know, say whatever they want to say, um, more in like kind of like the Commons, Old mm -hmm. Town Square 
um, fashion. So what are some of the other things that you're seeing new to the conference this year? One of the things that I have maybe noticed is more of a presence from community media and independent media makers versus policy makers. I, I think that's part of a long-term trend that we've seen in free press. I mean, and actually I come to free press from the community media field. I work, you know, worked in local communities creating media and helping people create media for 20 years. Um, and I came to these conferences because I wanted to be able to build allies so I can do better work in my community and you know, help, you know, help you know, the people that I work with create better media. And we're seeing more and more of that, I think, within, within, the, the, within the conference. Um, and I think that's a really healthy thing, frankly, because it, it reinforces the idea that it's people who, people who matter, not necessarily decision makers who matter. And, and I think that, that that's the reason why you're seeing a proliferation of artists and expression at, at NCMR. Uh, it's because uh, it really gets to this heart of a question of, you know, do you have the ability to control your own content? Do you have the ability to control your own voice? Can your voice be heard and be distributed through internet, through radio, through television, through any of a number of means? And can you make an effect in the world? We think that people can, and we want to find ways to you know, enliven that experience and make it happen for people. That's why our media makers are actually starting to thrive within this environment. I'm, I'm overjoyed by it, and that's part of the reason why I'm part of Free Press now. Super exciting, the shifts that we're seeing here in media. Lots of converging technologies, lots of do-it-yourself, hands-on skill sharing, mm -hmm. which is really awesome. We're seeing a lot of different discussions going on about how to fund your own media, how to do it yourself. So we're really excited to be a part of that here in the Do-It-Yourself Community Media Lab. And um, we're broadcasting live on the internet, and hopefully some folks who weren't able to go to the conference are watching now. And so what's next for Free Press after this conference wraps up? Hopefully you'll be taking a break. We're gonna take a breather for maybe a day, uh, but actually what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be, we're gonna be look, getting feedback from people as part, part of the experience. We're gonna be trying to, trying to build on some of the successes, and also, We've been looking at some of the compelling voices that are being heard here. People who are doing policy work at the local level, or they're doing, you know, they're they're doing struggles to, you know, may have better representation in local newspapers, for example. We're trying to find people from across the United States who can be champions for our movement. And the thing that we're going to be thinking about and we're looking forward to as we're thinking going into our 10th year at Free Press is we're really thinking about finding ways that we can underline those success stories. We can build on those champions and we can build the strength of our movement so that we can have maximum impact in the years ahead. Because, you know, technology is going to keep changing and media consolidation is going to keep being a hidden problem in our country. We need to change that, and the only way we change that is if everyone we work with is stronger, and we can actually, we can actually build a national movement that it cares about media reform. We're on our way, and that's what you're gonna see in the months ahead. We're gonna be underlining some of those success stories and those great voices that you're hearing at this conference. Well, Mike Wassenaar, really great words to live by. Free Press says, change the media, change the world. Right. We hope to do that today and the next day while we're at the conference. It, Thanks so much for joining you're us. You're welcome, and if uh, people want more information about what's going on with the conference, you can see media is being posted up on our website, freepress.net. You can be a part of it at home. Uh, without Follow them on Twitter, like them on Facebook. Hashtag NCMR13. That's right, thank you so much. We'll be right back live from the National Conference on Media Reform. I'm Vanessa Graber. Change the channel! Change the channel! Make a sound! Share the Share echo! the echo and show the world your face. It is your right to seek. It is your right to receive. It is your right to impart. The doors of public distribution are constantly changing. It is our duty to bar those doors from closing. We will not let our voices be silenced through legislation, through commodification, through the lumbering giants pulling the plug. I believe in public access. I believe in public access. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. I'm Vanessa Maria Graber, and we're broadcasting live from the National Conference on Media Reform here in Denver, Colorado. And this is a do-it-yourself community media special. I'm joined by two super awesome guests who are also my friends, can't lie. Uh, we have a good friend from Philly from the Media Mobilizing Project, Brian Mercer, and Megan Sheehan from the Vermont Worker Center, who also was in Philly for a while. Um, hanging out at Prometheus Radio Project. Welcome to our show. Thanks for having us, Vanessa. And so you guys are at the conference participating in a really cool panel tomorrow about storytelling and organizing. And so um, I'd love it if you tell some of our viewers a little bit about the work that you do through MMP and the Vermont Worker Center and the connection that you have between organizing, um, the community, storytelling, using media. How are these things all intersectional? What do you hope to talk about in your panel tomorrow? Yeah, so the Vermont Worker Center was formed in the late 90s uh, by a group of low-wage workers in Vermont, um, really organizing around workplace issues. Uh, and then at a certain point realized that we really needed to build more power in order to change what was politically possible in our state and really get at some of the root causes of poverty um, and the ways that people are struggling. So in 2008, we launched the Health Care as a Human Right campaign. And a huge part of that was actually going out into all of our communities and really having people share their stories um, and s with the crisis, with the healthcare crisis, um, and really putting that at the forefront, um, which both broke isolation um, of people who are experiencing the crisis, um, really helped us change, reframe the story, the public story around, um, around healthcare and what the purpose of our healthcare system is. Um, so because of a lot of this organizing and, and storytelling and documenting our stories, we were able to pass uh, in 2011 the first state law to establish a universal healthcare system. Um, so we're still fighting that battle and, and fighting to, to create that system, but storytelling and organizing um, have been a huge part of that. So we're really excited here to, tomorrow to talk more about um, the role that storytelling and media plays in our organizing. That's very cool. So Brian, MMP is known for doing really cool organizing in Philly with students, Philadelphia Student Union, um, immigrant populations, taxi cab drivers, health workers, all kinds of people. And usually, you know, those stories in the mainstream media, at least in Philadelphia, kind of appear as news reports, right? And so tell us a little bit, like, how storytelling diverges from these reports and how that maybe bridges the gap between these impacted populations and the issues you're trying to talk about. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Vanessa, for having us on here, too. I mean, at the Media Mobilizing Project, we believe that movements begin with the telling of untold stories. Um, and so our, our work has been to build the media, media and communications infrastructure that connects up these different struggles that you're talking about, from students to workers to, um, to people losing their homes, and, and to, to have, have a means that people can have a, have a voice um, and, and build stronger ties and relationships with each other um, so that we can, we can win the, the fights of tomorrow, um, that we're united uh, moving forward. And so um, on, on this, this question that you're asking, I think with the, with the, the mainstream media that we see, um, it often either isolates or alienates the, the struggles of poor and working people, it dehumanizes people, um, and it doesn't, it, it doesn't uh, have a sense of history, um, a long perspective on where these issues come from, and a sense of vision of you know, what, what can really be done to, to change the issues in our communities. And so um, through, through um, our work, which has been on the level of um, teaching people storytelling practices, um, to connecting people to um, basic media and communication skills, um, to designing collaboratively with organizations and groups, um, communication strategies and campaigns, we see that there's a way to, to tell a different story, to build a different narrative that, that connects up our struggles and, and builds our power as poor and working people to, to transform society and, and, and make, uh, make sure that our human rights are met. So. Yeah, and you see some of this played out locally um, in the fight for paid sick days in Philadelphia, and a lot of people don't, they were like, why do people need this? And, you know, in going to some of these rallies, oftentimes I've heard restaurant workers and other contractors talk about times when they mm. were unable to take off work and they were sick and not having health insurance. And I think that these stories really connect the realities that these 
you know, impacted populations face when it comes to some of these, um, you know, difficulties they're facing when they're just trying to work and stay healthy mm -hmm. in their lives. And I think the other examples we've been seeing this recently, again, at the local level, is in all these school closings, right, mm -hmm. in Chicago and Philadelphia and other cities where we're hearing the voices of students and teachers and nurses and bus drivers and, like, how their daily life is going to be impacted, um, you know, through the story telling so how do you bridge the gap between like telling a story you know like mm -hmm. I'm telling these stories to you now and and using media yeah I mean I think part of building bridging the gap is is um, using the opportunity to tell these stories to, to build new relationships that that media making can actually be part of um, a community organizing process and and a way to, to build new relationships across groups that wouldn't collaborate otherwise um, a way to you know define who who our enemy is who the, who the villain really is in this story and who, what we're up against um, and as a as a way to understand our issues better so that we can fight smarter around those issues. Megan, tell us a little bit about the radio work that you're doing um, with, with migrant workers in Vermont and also with people affected by healthcare and how you've kind of maybe changed the way that we listen to traditional radio. Yeah, so um, we've certainly seen in Vermont the impact of media and consolidation um, in many ways through our through our organizing, whether it's a newspaper saying, you know, we don't have enough people to come and cover an event because we've cut all of our reporters from, you know, not having all the radio stations, a lot of the radio, local radio stations closing. Um, and so we, one of our, our sister organizations, uh, Migrant Justice, um, we have worked a lot with them um, to be producing our, our own radio and to be reporting on our own, on our struggles um, and recognizing that there's the story of the plight, so the story of how we're, how we're suffering and how we're struggling, but we also need to, to tell the story of the fight and how we are organizing and how we are standing up um, for our communities. Um, and so we produce a Put People First radio, um, you know, ab about once or twice a month. And it's also a great leadership development opportunity so far to take the time to talk about what are the stories that are already out there um, that we're up against and what is our story and how how is our story trying to transform that that um, overall story so yeah it's been really great and exciting and we hope to keep expanding and doing more that is totally kick-ass man <laughs> you guys really rock but I want to talk about um, the work that you're doing in the much larger national context, and that's this media justice movement. And so y'all are here with a big de bigger delegation from the Media Action Grassroots Network, which is coordinated by the Center for Media Justice. Tell us about Magnet, Media Justice, and you know this network of people that are doing similar work to what you're doing all over the country. Mm. Yeah, um, so we're we're here with the Media Action Grassroots Network and and Magnet. It's a project um, housed out of the Center for Media Justice, um, but collaboratively put together um, with anchors and members throughout the country. Um, and and those anchors and members are organizations that are based in everyday struggles at the intersections of social justice, from reproductive justice to workers' rights to housing rights to um, community development. And and, and across those different issues, really seeing the important role that um, media justice and, and making sure that we have a just media policy plays in shaping all of these different struggles that we're facing. And so the, the Media Action Grassroots Network has, has led um, some amazing campaigns helping to stop the, the merger of AT&T and T-Mobile, um, which would have um, meant such increases in the cost of cell phones for people um, and is running a great campaign right now now to ensure that um, prisoners are able to contact their families and vice versa um, and, and not face exorbitant costs and rates um, for making those phone calls from um, telecom companies that are just profiting off of that situation um, and, and really building uh, a new generation um, leaders um, in this media justice movement um, that, that are grounded and coming from communities to, to be able to define the, the media policy that we need. I want to thank you so much for being on our show, telling us about the great work that you do, and hopefully you guys will continue storytelling, fighting the good fight. Tell everybody when the workshop is tomorrow and how they can find out more information about the organizations that you represent. 
Yeah, so if you're here in Denver or you're checking out the live stream online, um, we're going to be getting together at 9 a.m. tomorrow, the Storytelling as Social Change Workshop. Um, we're joined by um, Matt Howard from the Iraq Veterans Against the War, um, by Alandria Williams from uh, Highlander Folk School, and by Betty Yu. And so it's going to be a really great workshop. And how can people find out about Media Mobilizing Project? Um, they can find out about MMP um, at our website, mediamobilizing.org. And our website is www.workercenter.org. Thank you so much. You're listening to the, or watching, <laughs> the Do It Yourself Community Media Special live from the National Conference on Media Forum here in Denver, Colorado. I'm Vanessa Maria Graber, your host. We're going to take a short break, and then we'll come back with more guests from the conference. So stay tuned. I am so thrilled to be here in the studios of Philly Can. It's, it's like a dream come true. I know how hard people in Philadelphia worked and worked to make public access happen. And it wasn't easy and it took a long time, but looking around at, at this wonderful space and the kinds of activities that have been going on here, I am so happy that this is happening. To be able to amplify community voice, to be able to amplify the creative spirit comes first and foremost through public television. That outlet, that advantage is not allowed in commercial television. The training, the socialization, the networking that takes place in a public access studio does not take place anywhere else. Uh, this this studio really shows the, the importance of freedom and mm. the importance of the fact that people, if they struggle, they can really win. And as Frederick Douglass said, power concedes mm -hmm. nothing without a struggle. And this struggle has really brought a lot and I'm so, I can't tell you <laughs> how thrilled I am. I'm really, I, it makes me want, it, it really, I've, I got very emotional here. I, because I know so many people who've worked so hard and, and had so much patience and so much dedication to really make this happen. And I thank you for fulfilling the, those dreams, the, your dreams and my dreams. Oh. Oh. I can't believe it's like a dream. Oh. Actually, it is because it was so long in coming, and you guys yeah. said it. <laughs> Welcome back to the Do It Yourself Community Media Special. I'm Vanessa Maria Graber, and we're broadcasting live from the National Conference on Media Reform here in Denver, Colorado. I have with me two more exciting and awesome guests. I have with me Artika Tyler from Minnesota and the Community Justice Project, and also Pedro Joel Espinosa from the Institute for Popular Education of Southern California and Voces Mobiles or Mobile Voices. Thank you for joining the show. Good to be here. Thank, Thank you for having us. <laughs> yes. So if you guys can just share your microphone um, when we ask questions, that way the people who are tuning in can hear both of you. Um, so Artika, I'll go first to you. You're with the Campaign for Prison Phone Justice. And so some stuff is going down right now with the FCC. There's been some developments after a really long fight you know, to get reduced prices for families who are receiving phone calls from incarcerated individuals. Tell us about the campaign, what the actionable items are, and what your campaign seeks to change. 
Yes, well, I'm excited to be a part of the campaign. Just for a little background about me, I'm a law professor from Minnesota. I teach in the Community Justice Project, which is a civil rights clinic. So we work on a number of criminal justice and juvenile justice issues. So in being a part of the campaign for prison phone justice, this has been an exciting opportunity to shed light on a very important issue, to look at the high cost of prison phone calls, which basically creates a barrier for family and communities members to stay in contact with their loved ones who are incarcerated. So Vanessa, in just a simple sense, in the state of Minnesota, a 15 minute phone call, a collect call costs about $17.30. And I don't know for you, but for me, that would be very costly to remain in contact if I had an incarcerated loved one. So one of the things that we've worked on is helping to raise awareness and mobilize community members to write into the FCC about this very issue. How are they impacted? What are some of the issues? And how we can help to ensure that the cost of prison phone calls are reasonable so families can remain in contact. And when I say families, I want to talk about just one particular group. It's children. In the state of Minnesota, we have over 15,000 children who have an incarcerated parent. So as we look at this in a practical sense, that means that it's very difficult for them to remain in contact. And you may say then, well, they can go visit their parents. But on the average, most people are incarcerated about 100 miles away from home. So it definitely creates a barrier to be able to go in and see your loved ones and remain in contact. So phone calls are a vital aspect of being able to say, hi, being able to check in and see about your loved ones. So our work has been raising awareness, not only in our state, but nationwide, with hopes to bring forth reform that will ensure that there are reasonable costs for phone calls and that we can make sure that phone calls are an accessible means and tools for community members to remain in contact. That's really great. And something that really like impacts families who aren't the people who are the quote unquote offenders, you know, so it seems really unfair that folks who, you know, have nothing to do with the law or the legal system are the ones bearing the brunt of this cost and like not being able to provide the support that people need to be able to get through a sentence. Mm -hmm. And so um, tell us what's going on at the FCC right now. Um, what kinds of developments have happened in this campaign and what can we hopefully look forward to with some changes that they are proposing? The FCC in December opened up a period for public comment. So basically that's an opportunity for community members to write in and talk about not only what are the challenges, but what reform should look like. So our clinic actually wrote in and talked about the fact that maintaining reasonable costs for prison phone calls would help to ensure not only that families can remain in contact, but also it helps to reduce recidivism. So it's just a practical, good practice overall for the benefit of all community members because we have found and based upon studies it shows that those who are able to remain in contact with their loved ones who are incarcerated are able to have a successful reintegration back into their communities and we know this is especially important when over 95 percent of those who are incarcerated today will be returning home at some point so one of the things that we did was we wrote in and we said okay based upon the themes of the campaign is that prison phone justice reform will help to promote safe communities by reducing recidivism and offering successful opportunities to reintegrate into society and to also build strong families. So that's been the theme and mantra of the campaign and articulating that message. Thank you, Artika. A very worthy cause. We hope that we can make more progress with this and you know stay up to date as further developments unfold. But now I want to go to you, Pedro. Um, you're doing work out of California. Yes. You're working with Latino populations and doing a lot of digital storytelling, yes. which is connected to all these other movements because if we can't tell the stories of how these unfair practices and laws are affecting our communities, it's really hard to affect change. So tell us about the work that you're doing in California. Yes, so um, specifically in Los Angeles, um, I am, I'm, I'm based out of Los Angeles, Debska is based in Los Angeles and uh, we are, uh, we work with the low-income immigrant community, right? Um, the immigrant community is uh, really diverse, right? So we work with the, with day laborers, household workers, um, low-income but strong families, and uh, so a lot of uh, uh, exciting activities have been happening in for the last uh, four years now, almost five years now, uh, where immigrant workers are telling their own stories and countering the negative stories that are written about them, using through their mobile phones, through their phones, basic phones, um, the 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 mobile voices platform is based out of uh, open source software and um, it's it's we, we we created something that's accessible for everybody 
uh, that's being the, the, the key word, accessibility, right? We, we know that there's a huge digital divide in the immigrant community, right? But something that we found out is that uh, most of the workers that we work with, they have phones, right? So what can, how can they tell the stories using what they already have? And it's through the phone, so they can send a picture. It works uh, uh, through an MMS, so they can take a picture, text, audio, and or video as well. And they can tell themselves their stories, right? So for the first time, it's just so great to know that there are day laborers that are bloggers, right? The mm -hmm. household workers that are using it as an organizing tool, uh, for example, to promote the Household Worker Bill of Rights. Uh, we have, um, uh, for example, household workers are, are, are telling their stories and, and they're telling the world, hey, they treat, they treat the dog better than they treat me, right? They don't give me uh, enough rest. They owe me money, right? They're, and so they're using it as an organizing tool as well. And uh, that's an example of the, the stories that are coming out of Los Angeles. And I think it's really important, you know, as being a Latina woman to have this network, this dialogue in Spanish where people can communicate in their own languages because so much of the media here in the United States is in English, you know, even though we have a large Spanish-speaking population. So it's really great to hear that you're organizing people to speak in their own language, in their own voice to address the issues that affect their community. So before we wrap up, I'd really love to tell people how they could get more information about your two campaigns and how they can maybe donate money, get involved, volunteer, we're trying to recruit more people for all of these causes. So Artika, tell us how people can learn more about the campaign for prison phone justice. You can go online to uh, prisonphonejustice.org and you can sign up to become a champion for the issue. You can take action. You can sign on to the FCC uh, petition for change. And more importantly, you can spread the word because when I first heard about prison phone justice, I said, what is that? But now that I see that it's an industry in the sense of, as I talked about the high cost, the reason for the high cost is because of the commissions or kickbacks that are paid to the State Department of Corrections or county jails when they make private contracts then with just a handful of private phone companies. So as we look at this, I think in the simple sense of the action that I'd like for you to take is just spread the word about prison phone justice and urge the FCC to help set reasonable costs, to place a cap on those costs so we can ensure that families can remain in contact and people can have a smooth transition back into their, their community. So I think it's a human rights and a human dignity issue related to communication. Thanks, Artika. And Pera, tell us how we can get more information about the Institute for Popular Education of Southern California and your project, Voces Mobiles. Yes, uh, so for more information, uh, people can go to www.idepska.org. And uh, to check out the stories that I've been talking about, please feel free to go to uh, vosmob.net. That's V-O-Z-M-O-B.net. And, uh, and please take advantage of, appropriate yourself of uh, your cell phones and uh, create your own media. Right nowadays, it's, we're consuming a lot of media, but we can also create a lot of media as well. Pedro, Artica, thank you so much for joining us on the Do It Yourself Community Media Special. Again, I'm Vanessa Graber. We're here in Denver at the National Conference for Media Reform. Up next, we have the Raging Grannies. They're fractivists from Colorado who came into the studios earlier today to sing a song to their governor about the fracking that's going on here in Colorado. So check out the video, and when we come back, we'll have some more awesome guests from the National Conference on Media Reform. Are we tracking who is fracking? Governor John, Governor John, what's the great big secrets about what's in those fluids? What's in there would curl your hair? Is this fracking worth your backing? Governor John, Governor John, will you avoid a sellout? Not even a wee doubt, we do care what's in there. Let's get cracking on with fracking in your yard, John, on your farm. They bought us all the gas rights, you won't sleep for their work lights. What's the harm? No need for alarm. What's he doing? Now he's suing. What's the deal? Governor John, the people want to be heard. 
You don't have the last word. Get a grip, Governor John. Keep our water, our clean water, contaminant free, carcinogen free. We need it for our livestock, our households and our gardens. What the frack, Governor John. What the frack, Governor John. Make a sound, share the share echo. The echo and show the world your face. It is your right to speak. It is your right to receive. It is your right to impart. The doors of public distribution are constantly changing. It is our duty to bar those doors from closing. We will not let our voices be silenced through legislation, through commodification, through the lumbering giants pulling the plug. I believe in public access. I believe in public access. Stay tuned. Hey, welcome back to the Do-It-Yourself Community Media Special, live from the National Conference on Media Reform here in Denver. I'm Vanessa Maria Graber, your host. I hope you enjoyed that last song by the Raging Grannies. They were super sweet. They came in here, they sang us a song, and we hope that you'll learn more about their organization and the work they do to fight fracking here in Colorado. But now I have two more really great guests. They just keep coming in from all over the conference. We have Betty Yu from the Center of Media Justice and Magnet, and we also have Matt Howard from Iraq Veterans Against the War. Welcome, thanks for joining us here today. So tomorrow you have a really great panel coming up. So Betty, tell us a little bit about the panel and Magnet and all the big crew people that y'all have here doing oh really great stuff at the conference. Okay, well, I'm gonna plug um, the storytelling strategy session that I'm moderating um, that Matt is on, and I think two of your other guests earlier uh, talked about it, um, Megan and Brian. So they're both also speaking on it. It's uh, called um, Storytelling Strategies for Social Change, and it's in Governor Square, room 10, from 9 to 10.30 tomorrow in the morning. I know some people will be partying, but they can hopefully get up and come to get a really good session. Come to the yeah, workshop. it's a really good workshop. And basically, folks are going to be talking about how they, they view social media and video and cultural strategies in general for organizing and how they've integrated it into, into their work. And that um, I think we're going to talk a lot about you know, how you know, we look at political change, but we have to see that um, cultural change and changing the hearts and minds of the way people are thinking and to really win over folks. Um, culture and arts and the media is really integral to that. Um, so I think that we're going to have a really, really, really great panel and discussion. It's really participatory. It's going to be really interactive with the participants who come, and we want to hear from them as well because we know there's a, a wealth of knowledge and experience in the room. There's a lot of power here at this conference, and we want to hear from folks. So it's really going to be a conversation, a dialogue, and not just a one-way uh, conversation. Um, and then also the, f the final person will be Landria, who's uh, from Highlander Center, who you'll hear from later, I know, who will be also be featured on that panel. Um, Media Action Grassroots Network, um, we are, I think folks have talked about it, we had a bunch of our members on so far since 5.30 and um, we're a local to local advo advocacy network of uh, grassroots cultural arts and media 
um, service organizations, and we're really multi-sector. I think what makes us really unique as a network is that we have folks who are coming from all um, aspects of movement building work. Um, so folks who are using arts and culture to advance social change, folks who are doing immigrant rights, housing, um, labor, uh, anti-war folks. I mean, that we have a lot of folks who are coming together but understand the need um, to fight for corporate media accountability, the need to fight um, the, you know, the underrepresentation of our issues in the corporate media, but not just to fight back, like be reactive, but we also have to create our own stories and create our own media. Um, and that we also have to own our own media infrastructure. And so groups like Prometheus Radio Project, who are advocating for groups to own their own radio stations, uh, public access television stations like Philly Cam and Denver Open Media here, uh, you know, advocating for groups to, to own their own community broadband networks. That's all part of what Magnet's mission is about. Seeing me media justice, not just about content, but it's about controlling the pipeline and infrastructure. And our end goal is, uh, you know, fighting for economic and racial justice. And we have a del uh, we have lo dozens of members here um, from Magnet, and we brought a delegation of 22 uh, folks um, Magnet and from all over CMR. the <laughs> all over the country from Magnet and from the campaign for prison phone justice and. Um, yeah, so I'll plug the t-shirt later maybe. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to take up too so much time. So Magda does really, really great work. And one of my favorite things about being involved with the, um, you know, the organization and the network is knowing what's going on in different parts of the country and hearing the work that all the people are doing in all these different sectors. And so not only are we creating media and creating a network, but we're also at, like informing each other, right, about all the different struggles going on because sometimes it gets really easy to, you know, fall into the trap of your own issue, but Magnet really does a good job of bringing all those issues together and showing how they all overlap and we're kind of in it all together. And so with that said, we're going to go to an issue <laughs> and um, we're going to talk up to Matt Howard from Iraq Veterans Against the War and you have a new campaign that you are launching. So tell us about the Right to Heal. So we launched uh, the Right to Heal initiative on uh, on the twenty this the nineteenth March nineteenth, which was the tenth anniversary of the invasion of Iraq. Um, basically, we've been working with Iraqi human rights groups, the Organization of Women's Freedom in Iraq, and uh, the Federation of Workers, Councils, and Unions in Iraq. And they are both very much grass grassroots organizing groups that are doing important work on the ground. Um, and we're working with them in the Center for Constitutional Rights to basically bring a thematic hearing in an international um, hearing uh, to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights to hold the U.S. accountable. And so what that means in, in more kind of general terms is a way to, to really show showcase the way that uh, health violations have happened on the parts of Iraqis and also for U.S. veterans and how the U.S. is really accountable for that and not only that they need to acknowledge that but also that they need to pay reparations to the folks inside of Iraq and need to find, um, you know, actually need to be caring for veterans and Iraqis in ways that they obviously haven't done. Um, so far and you know, I think part of the, the, the idea of launching this campaign is we know um, that you know, folks in Iraq really the the stories of what's happened inside of there have been you know not visibilized at all and you know the, in working with some of those groups that are highlighting things like the cancer rates that are really super high around military bases and these birth defects birth now defects. you're seeing these pictures on social media so the organization of women's freedom has done a lot of documenting of birth defects in certain areas and how they skyrocketed after the US military came in um, so we're really trying to link the the way that health violations have happened on both sides and really point the finger at the US um, and, and using an international legal framework because for 10 years, groups like the Center for Constitutional Rights have been trying a domestic legal strategy and have got shut down time and time again. And by having the most two impacted communities, we think there's something significant there. Well, it's interesting that you talk about this campaign. It's really s exciting, but interesting because this media reform movement and free press and a lot of the important work that Democracy Now! did came as a response to the invasion and the war on Iraq and the lack of media coverage that was going on at that time. And so it's kind of hard to believe, you know, 10 years later, we're still fighting to have these stories and these voices heard and the truth told to the people out here. So um, before 
before we wrap up and go to the next interview, Betty, tell us how people can get involved with the Center for Media Justice and Magnet, and tell us how they can support your cause by buying some merch and yes, uh, yes, yes. showing some love to the Magnet family. Yeah, definitely. I just want to also just say that um, that the issues that we, we also organize around, right, the campaign for prison phone justice, keeping the internet open, uh, protection on p mobile phones. I mean, these are all day-to-day -day issues that affect, um, you know, people of color, low-income folks. Um, you know, we're seeing that now in the South, in rural areas, phone companies are actually trying to cut out, cut down landlines because they're like, oh, everyone has a cell phone, right? But that's actually not true. And 40% of rural America still lack access to the internet. And in, on, on, in native reservations, it's 50%, you know, that folks lack access to the internet. So the digital divide is still real. And so I just wanted to say that what we do is that we're really connected to to the issues on the ground that, you know, like we, you know, these are basic human rights and communication rights so that we need access to these communication platforms for our day to day living, you know, and so uh, that's, I just wanted to really kind of emphasize that. Um, so we really want folks to kind of join Magnet um, and the website is www.mag-net.org and we do have a wonderful t-shirt that I just wanted to show real quick. If you don't know. And, um, the back says, whoever controls both media and metaphor shapes the culture and defines the future. And they're, um, you can buy them if you're here at our booth at the CMJ Center for Media Justice booth. All the funds go to the Media Action Grassroots Fund, which goes right back out to the members. So CMJ actually doesn't hold on to any of the funds. Thank you so much, Betty. And Matt, tell people how they can find out more about Iraq Veterans mm -hmm. Against the War and the Right to Heal campaign. Um, so we've got a website at IVAW.org, and then we just launched our website for the Right to Heal, which is righttoheal.org. Matt, Betty, thank you so much for doing this really important work and for joining us on the Do It Yourself Community Media Special. Up next, we have another interview with Aggie Ebrahimi Bazaz, who is with the National Alliance for Media Arts and Culture. So we'll take a look at that video and we'll come back with more awesome guests from the National Conference on Media Reform. I'm Vanessa Maria Graber and we'll be right back. Hello, I'm here with Aggie Ebrahimi Bazaz from the National Alliance of Media Arts and Culture. Thank you so much for joining us. Tell us a little bit about NAMAC. Uh, NAMAC, the National Alliance for Media Arts and Culture, is a national nonprofit uh, intermediary that aims to fortify and foster the field of independent media arts. We're a membership organization, um, and our members consist of nonprofit media arts organizations, youth media organizations, uh, independent media professionals, uh, independent filmmakers, cable access stations like Philly Cam actually is a trusted, valued member. Um, and we have students as well and affiliate members uh, and we aim to work together with our members to uh, nurture the field of independent media arts and also create uh, systems and structures that will promote creative practice. Yeah, and if you haven't checked out NAMAC's website, it's really, really awesome and you often feature some filmmakers and the part of the constituents that you represent um, they get to blog and sort of talk about the work that they do. Is that right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. You hit it on the head. Uh, we really aim to highlight the work that our members are doing and that also is just happening in the field because um, we work a lot in Washington and so we want the, the funders that we speak to and the organizations and the officials to know what's happening in the media arts and what kind of impact uh, media arts professionals are having uh, in society and education and workforce readiness. In, in those levels, yeah. And so what are some of the struggles that they're facing? We're at the Media Reform Conference, right? So we're united in that mainstream media isn't really supporting the work of independent artists and media makers. Tell us what are some of the biggest issues that your constituency struggles with and how do you advocate for them? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, some of the issues we're facing right now um, are things like funding. How do you keep uh, securing funding and becoming a, being a sustainable nonprofit organization in a in a climate that's changing and and federal dollars are shrinking and um, foundations bring, pull in money and they pull out money. Uh, corporations bring in money and pull out money. So how can nonprofits adapt to this ever changing climate? Uh, technology changes, of course. How do you change your communications needs to meet new technologies, uh, reach new constituencies, uh, local nonprofits are, are looking to go national and how do you build that connective tissue to, to connect to national audiences and to other nonprofits and we really help to um, help 
help nonprofits think through that. In terms of filmmaking, we right now um, some of the big trends are in transmedia, cross-platform storytelling. So we we recently hosted a Google Hangout um, inquiring about what are the what are the kind of steps you need to take to tell a multi-platform story? Why should you do it? Should you do it? What kind of stories require that? Um, a lot of filmmakers right now, when they look for funding, they have to think about issues of audience engagement and impact. Um, so we're hosting a, a blog salon, and we just launched a Tumblr to talk about engagement in the media arts and the visual arts as well. What does this mean? This one, it's a very loaded term. Um, what does it mean for artists? How do we how do we create engagement? What are models of engagement that we think are are viable and sustainable? Yeah, when I was at the Name That Conference um, in September in Minneapolis, um, there was lots of talk about community and you know collaboration, and so it's really nice to see those themes continued at this particular conference right now. So I just want to give a plug for some of your upcoming events or initiatives that you're working on in NABAC. Tell our viewers what's going on in the next month or so. What can people look forward to from NABAC? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, next week we'll be at Arts Advocacy Day in Washington, D.C., along with Alliance for Community Media and a lot of our other partner organizations. Um, we're hosting a webinar with Women Make Movies on how to navigate the International Film Festival circuit. It's really affordable and it's for independent filmmakers to just uh, know how to best market their films when they go to film festivals, especially in a market that's very saturated with festivals. Um, we're hosting a webinar on managing burnout. So as a nonprofit professional, how do you manage your time? I might need to go to that one. I think we all need to go to that. <laughs> and we're also hosting a blog salon on engagement, and we have our Leadership Institute coming up this summer. And we're also always open to ideas. If there are things that people want to talk about and they, they just don't know how to do it, um, they can come to us and we'll, we'll build the network and we'll build the infrastructure to host those conversations. Well, man, I'm glad that Minimax is around. You have so many great resources and Thank education. You. And so um, it'd be really great if you can tell people how they can plug in and get connected because I can't remember this long list of information, but I'm sure it's <laughs> on your website and social media. So tell folks quickly how they can get connected. Thanks very much. It is on our website at namac.org. That's N-A-M-A-C.org. And on uh, Twitter, uh, at namac. And we're also on Facebook, National Alliance for Media Arts and Culture. And people can email me, too, at aggie at namac.org. And they're a nonprofit, so you can also support by giving money. Please do. <laughs> <laughs>the do-it-yourself community media special broadcasting live from the national conference on media forum here in denver colorado i'm your host vanessa maria graber and i'm joined by alandria williams of the highlander center and chad johnson from the saint paul neighborhood network thank you so much for joining us thank you thank you so alandria yes <laughs> you guys are the closers we're here to end with some really awesome stuff <laughs> Um, but anyway, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the work that you're doing with justice organizations and media reform work, and maybe um, your thoughts on the, on the direction that this movement needs to go in, in the next couple of years in order to affect change in a real way. Yeah, so um, my name is Delandria, um, again, um, and the Highlander Center supports grassroots organizations and community leaders in 13 southern states and Appalachia, um, and we work across the country and the world. Um, and for us, it was really important that we got involved with media justice because media justice is a tying in and a link through all the issues we work on. And it's a baseline, right? So if you think about housing, you think about transportation, you think about prisons, you think about all the issues that our folk have to deal with on a daily basis, this is one of the key ones, right? So if you don't have broadband, you can't get a job because you can't apply for jobs online. Like there are all those things that are just basic. And so one thing we've been trying to do is to help think if culture organizing is where it's at, right? And culture is how we move throughout our day. And it's the humanity of all of us. How does media show us, right? How are, the, how are we represented in the media? Normally it's negative, normally it's backward, slow, stupid. You barely find positive representations from the South unless it's like some old school representation from back in the day during slavery or civil rights, there's nothing now. And so one reason why we're involved is to say, actually we're here now, 
We're not just backwards people who are all in the red states. We're actually doing positive work and we need our voices amplified. And I think also for a lot of organizers, you know, they get so caught up in, in talking to people and trying to change policy and, and meet with lawmakers that they really um, forget to use media as an mm -hmm. actual strategy mm -hmm. to advance their cause. Mm -hmm. So tell us how the Highlander Center has maybe embraced media as a way to advance the issues that they're trying to support. Yeah, and so I would I would say that, so Highlander's been around since 1932 um, and was really active in the labor movement, civil rights movement, all movements. And what we know is that the civil rights movement changed because of media, right? Like every movement has changed by seeing stuff on screens and having radio and listening to things and knowing that the mass rally is gonna happen through the radio. Um, and the same is true today, right? So community radio stations are really important to getting people to know here's what's happening in my local community. Here's how I can be involved. Um, Facebook is how now I don't have to do anything trying to get young people to my stuff. They just send it on off themselves and they do recruitment for me. I have to do nothing at this point. And so media is so essential, especially because I live in a place where people are isolated, right? You have to go across mountains to get to each other. And media is the one way that people can communicate across isolated areas, which is why the broadband fight is so important, which is why the prison phone campaign is so important, because those are the platforms that people are able to have health and are able to communicate and, and organize for action. Well, thank you so much for sharing, you know, the work that you do and, you know, keep up the good work. I think we have a long way to go as far as like pushing the envelope yeah. for media reform and changing the discourse around media justice, yes. which is a much more, I don't know, targeted effort yep. to change the media that's yep. beyond policy yep. work, about but that. more about access, representation, and equity and having yep. people you know, like ourselves, be able to be the media just like we are right now. And I would just say it's actually beyond that because media justice is actually about changing the entire narrative and actually having your culture be the linchpin. And so it's even past the policies. This is about what is our cultural practices and how are we completely represented and how are we controlling and owning and distributing completely. Yeah, preserving our culture and our language. And for a lot of us, especially like indigenous people, are, you know, their they're very own identity and existence. Yeah. And so I totally agree with you. And thank you so much for chatting. We're going to have to chat more. Yeah. So Chad Johnston. Chad has just joined the St. Paul Neighborhood Network. And you are also a MAGNET member. Tell us about your experience working with MAGNET and the importance of building relationships, building coalitions, and really kind of, you know, banding together to, to fight the man. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> gotta fight the man. Um, gotta fight the man. Gotta fight the man. And the women. Thanks, Vanessa. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I th I've been working as, as a media activist for probably 15 odd years now, something like that. And I, I think one of the things we always struggle with is how to, how to tie the issues together. So how prison phone justice and rural broadband and access to community media, how all those things tie together. That's really difficult. It's an increasingly complicated landscape. And I think one of the reasons I really like Magnet and I've been just thrilled to be a part of that network is they literally try and take all these different issues and bridge people together and build coalitions around social justice and media justice to try and actually create real change. Free press is great. I love free press. I've been to every free press conference. Um, one of the challenges, though, is we all come and talk about these issues and then we have a hard time coming together and actually making action happen from them. And so Magnet has been really good at building coalitions, building partners, getting people together and really coming up with solid platforms, solid action plans. And that's what this movement needs. That's what any movement it needs, right? You can't do it by yourself. Um, so I'm always thrilled when Magnet has things and I get to go or I get invited or um, I'm on their list server, or whatever. Um, and that's the kind of work I think we need to continue doing because we come here and with I mean, there's so many different issues from so many different places and so many different people working at them at different ways, but connecting those people and pulling them together so that we can fight the man um, is hard. It's hard work. It is hard work, and I think that one of the things that I most enjoy about the conference is this feeling of solidarity, you yeah. know, because organizing is hard, doing policy work is hard, raising money when there's no money is it's hard. hard, you know? <laughs> and when you have other people that are doing this work and it's like, it's gonna be okay, we're in this together, 
You know, I feel energized when I leave, and I feel a sense of hope that there's good people all over the country doing this work and who haven't given up and that are finding new ways to kind of attack the beast. Mm -hmm. So it's just really great to connect with people like you, Alandria and Chad, and all the many great people that we've seen here in Denver. And I just look forward to the next opportunity we get to talk to each other, hang out, dance it out, you know, and, and just have a good time because, you know, at the end of the day, I think we do this because we're passionate and it's, it's kind of fun and, and occasionally we win, right? And so um, it's good to share that with other people. And so um, I just also want to let people know how they can connect with your organizations and find out more information about the work that you're doing and so they can get involved. So Alandria, tell people how they can get connected to the Highlander Center. So um, you can go on to our website at www dot highlandercenter.org and also check us out tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. at Storytelling Strategies for Social Change. Um, it'll be a, a kick uh -huh, workshop um, th that's really interactive, so come on out. Awesome, and if you're in the Twin Cities or interested in the work that we're doing with Technology Education, St. Paul Neighborhood Network is spnn.org. Thank you so much to two of you, and thanks for all of you for watching, and if you want to keep the conversation going, don't, you know, don't just give up. Go on the Twitter, NCMR13 is the hashtag we're using. Keep the dialogue going. We have lots more to do at this conference. We got some parties tonight, another plenary. We have some great workshops tomorrow. So make sure you connect with all the great people here, if not in person, but check out all their websites. For the Do It Yourself Community Media Special, I'm Vanessa Maria Graber. Thanks again for tuning in live to our show from the National Conference on Media Reform. Thank you.